What's going on guys? Um, so this video is going to be about uh, summarizing everything that Dr. Michael Militech mentioned um, about challenging the the myths of testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, but before I get into that, my first point is really going to be like an introduction and a thank you. I'm also going to have a timestamp that you can just click forward, uh, jump forward to so you don't have to go through this. But first of all, thank you so much for the uh, appreciation and the constructive feedback that I got for the last video that I made. That was the first video that I've ever made of this sort. Uh, and published it so i was a little bit nervous i'm probably a little bit nervous even right now um, but again thank you for all the constructive feedback it was really encouraging um one of the things that i heard was okay <clears throat> speak slower i think i had three different people tell three different people telling me to speak slower um, now i will absolutely make sure to do that because i do understand that i have an accent as well besides that um this is something that you guys can all use to increase your productivity but the reason I speak faster is because I look and I watch every single thing that I do faster, whether it's entertainment, TV, seminars, movies, audiobooks, every all of the different methods of media that we ingest information, you can make all of those faster for yourselves. Uh, there's this uh, Chrome extension that I end up using. It's called uh, Video Speed Controller. Also, there's this, I use a gaming mouse uh, and anyone that really wants to be really productive needs to have a gaming mouse or my, a mouse with like a lot of different buttons. So these two buttons are the ones that I use to increase the speed of anything that I'm watching or observing at that point in time. Um, so for example, this is one of the most important parts of this guy's video. So I'm just going to show you how I'm already watching it at a speed that's much faster than normal. And with this Chrome extension, you're not locked to like a speed of 1x, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75. You can literally make uh, custom speed improvements or increments or decrements. Rather than treat the cause of aging or treat the cause of what some of those diseases might be. So this is the real stuff now. I thought, my topic is, is um, myths and facts. There is a relationship between normal serum, normal serum testosterone levels. Maintaining normal serum testosterone levels flat out will help you live longer. That, that's unequivocal now. There's enough studies. So as you can see, I'm, I'm, watch, I'm watching that at 1.75, but if I, I like click on the buttons, I'm going up by, uh, one point, by 0 0.05. So you can customize that for yourself and hopefully this technology tip helps you out in the future. Finally, it was references. I was told that I mentioned a lot of things. I had a lot of notes and uh, I did not reference anything. Uh, my bad, but it just takes so long to make these videos. So I'm going to do the next best thing, which is going to be I'm going to link or download and upload these slides at some point and link these slides for you guys because everything that he's mentioning here, all of the slides have all of the references at the bottom right side so for the video i'm just going to be going through everything that he actually mentioned and explained in the, se in the seminar that everyone that none of you guys can actually get but i'm also going to be linking the studies and the slides and everything so you can actually go through anything that you that you'd like to so let's start off now who is dr michael miller tech he's a clinical neuroscientist and a medical professional he is not just someone that's been in the medical professional forever he's also an ex-olympic weightlifting team coach uh, he was on the olympic weightlifting team back in 1984 or so so he has been an athlete himself uh, he started off in medicine and he mostly now concentrates on hormonal uh, production and stress and the brain and how they're all interconnected so that's who this guy is now we start off this uh seminar by a flaw in the well preconceived notions or older medical notions that they used to have so jama is the journal of american medicine or something else whatever it's like one of the biggest publishing magazines that's out there so these are the things that they once mentioned the myths basically testosterone supplementation for older men appears to have limited benefit testosterone does not improve function in older men and at six months total testosterone was higher in the placebo group so these are some of the old conventional wisdom things that every medical professional has taken from these studies the problem with that is the flaw in the study was that they used um test cypionate testosterone cypionate uh, as the ester to be testing but they tested after four weeks so they took a shot of 200 milligrams of test cypionate <clears throat> uh testosterone cypionate has a has a half-life of eight days but for the sake of convenience we're just gonna call it like seven days um because like in the study, they measured their testosterone levels at the end of four weeks. So half-life means if, if you're taking a 200 milligram shot, which is the higher end of the TRT range that that's considered right now. So if you're taking that thing, uh, by the end of the first week, you're gonna go from like 200 milligrams to 100 milligrams uh, effectively in your system. And from week to week two uh, to the end of week three, it's gonna be, so week two to the beginning of week three, it's gonna be 100 to 50 milligrams. From there 50 to 25 and then finally by the end of v4 it's going to be 25 to 12.5 so someone that started off with an injection of 200 milligrams of test you're testing them at the end at 12.5 milligrams of test so obviously at uh, i mean at six months or something or whatever whenever they're going to be testing it the people that are being supplemented with it they only have 12.5 or 1 16th of the amount that they initially started off with so that was the one of the major one of the biggest flaws in that study 
Um, <clears throat> and then they quote that the placebo is, is going to be higher. So the other things that he mentioned, uh, young kids all the way down to 17 that he's seen in his practice and even people that I've met before, everyone, it, anyone and everyone can be deficient in testosterone. Anybody can be hypogonadal. It doesn't have to be something that you do. You can just be hypogonadal genetically, or it could be uh, your eating habits, this habits, an injury, concussion, anything of that sort. The problem is none of these kids that have symptoms are getting the medical treatment that they require because of the conventional wisdom of before. So previously, um, the levels used to be they weren't even 400 to 900. I've actually mentioned in my uh, range in my notes here they were 400 to 900, but previously the ranges used to be 400 to 1500. I remember I got that information from the uh, Jay Campbell seminar, and now those same ranges are 200 to 850 or 900, depending on the country that you're in. So now when they're uh, when kids, young kids, are coming in with testosterone levels of 250 to 300, they're still within the no low normal range, and therefore they aren't getting the help that they require. <clears throat> um, so there's a one percent reduction, and so there's a one percent reduction in testosterone every year after the age of thirty. Uh, but this gets compounded even worse for men that are over seventy, because by the age of seventy, there's a lot more SHBG or sex horm hormone binding globulin. And if you go back into the previous video that I made, I show you how sex hormone binding globulin is what all free testosterone latches onto. So if there's more SHBG, you're gonna have, end up having lesser free T because there's more SHBG to bind to it and it's the free tea that's doing everything that testosterone is supposed to do in the system so since he's about trt and everyone from the age of 17 to 30 to 70 require trt he's just going through the different uh issues that different people of different ages uh face when they're having trt issues uh andropause shbg so one of the things that he mentions is a decrease in job performance and the decrease in job performance isn't because of uh physical effects like you're already tired and therefore you're performing bad in your job but it's actually how testosterone has an effect on the frontal lobe of the brain that makes you more productive and everything else this is going to tie up uh afterwards there's a slide out uh, further on that basically ties up into both of these things so the link relation between low testosterone and its effects on the brain is not just a physical symptom carryover. Examples mentioned are low job performance, frontal lobe is not performing to the standard that it should be. <clears throat> he also mentions big pharma and FDA and everything else. How big pharma, just like anything, if you've been in this industry or if you've been keeping up with the science and the medical liter literature for the past 20, 30 years, big pharma just cares about selling more medicine. Uh, they don't really care about the patient or treating the patient or anything of that sort. So they are waiting pretty much his, his point is that they're waiting for something to go wrong so that they can treat the symptoms as opposed to actually trying to treat the problem uh, itself by using hormones like PRT, testosterone. Um, mentions the notes, big pharma waiting for disease, of course. Uh, can be treated rather than use the hormones to fix the problems themselves. Maintaining normal serum testosterone levels equals longevity flat out. So that's the part of the video that I actually played for you guys because I thought it was the most important um, most important statement that he actually mentioned. <clears throat> but yeah, having uh, optimal levels of serum, uh, testosterone levels just means a happier and a much, much longer uh, and healthier life. Uh, in a study of 2300 men, the greatest longevity was, the, was with those in the highest endo endogenous testosterone levels. So I'm just going to go through the slides right here. <clears throat> the TRT man is. Uh, so why? Because conventional wisdom, people think that testosterone can cause myocardial infarctions. So. There's a relationship between normal serum testosterone levels and longevity, possibly due to the influence of androgen in the pinnacle cardiovascular. Okay. In a study of more than 2,300 men, the greatest longevity was in men with highest levels of endogenous testosterone. There was a 1.6x increase in the risk of death in men with lowest levels of endogenous testosterone. Uh, debunking of the myth. So the earlier onset of, okay, so in men that, that were 65 years and over and that had prostate cancer and therefore because of conventional vision, they were... Their testosterone was basically cut off. They weren't given any androgens anymore. There was a much larger uh, myocardial infarction rate or a heart attack. Basically, they, they died of heart attacks instead of anything else per se. So the answer uh, am I in, in, in men 65 years of age or older with prostate cancer have been on androgen suppression for more than six months. So here's the here's the the best light out of all of these that you definitely should take a look at. Normal testosterone levels, so all uh, all causes of mortality, 25% for normal testosterone level, moderately low testosterone level, 38%, and for low testosterone, uh, 41%. So that's a 16% increase in all cause mortality in low testosterone versus like normal testosterone levels. Coronary artery disease, 48% versus 29%, and cancer, 29% versus 26%. 
Uh, the myth of testosterone or TRT increasing the risk of atherosclerotic disease or basically the clogging of the arteries basically like that's the best way <laughs> to kind of show it to you but uh, how everyone's always talking about clogging of arteries and stuff now how does that work out 16 to 18 to 21 okay cool so the testosterone cholesterol numerous studies have shown higher levels of testosterone correlated with higher hdls and the hdl that comes because of the of the of the of the testosterone that you're using is going to remove cholesterol from the artery by a reverse cholesterol transport chain rct that's something that wasn't previously known but has recently been found out so debunking atherogenesis or ather the cause of atherosclerosis Men with lower testosterone are at a greater risk of ather atherosclerotic disease. And finally, testosterone, despite lowering HDL cholesterol, intensifies the RCT RCP and thereby exerts an anti-atherogenic uh, effect rather than a pro-atherogenic effect. So basically the exact opposite of causing atherosclerosis. Um, intracoronary artery injection of testosterone at physiologic concentrations in men with established atherosclerotic disease actually produce coronary artery dilation, so making it bigger. So the exact opposite of clogging arteries is what ended up happening when you have intracoronary artery injections of testosterone. Um, low T is greater uh, amounts of higher amounts of cardiovascular mortality. ADP, uh, ADT is like androgen deprivation therapy is like cutting off testosterone is unfavorable changes in the body that's okay this is one of the patients and the case studies that he mentions where someone had a blockage of the left artery for 40 percent the widow maker artery that's otherwise called uh and in six years of testosterone and androgen therapy he basically reduces it by less than it becomes less than half it becomes like 18 percent. so that was one of the case studies that he mentioned okay then we get to a correlation between testosterone and prostate cancer um, so for this one, the incidence of prostate cancer among men with late onset hypogonadism on TRT is no greater than that in the general population. So whether you're on TRT or an androgen therapy or not, it, your, the incidence of prostate cancer is not any higher or lower. Uh, except, for, except for a rise in the PSA shortly right after you begin androgen therapy, there's going to be a short rise. There's no increase of uh, prostate cancer growth or anything of that sort while on TRT. RD patients, uh, so he's just mentioning tumor markers. now. Yes, the, t the total testosterone has gone from 370 to 809 and the tumor markers have gone up, but the this increase is absolutely nothing as it was already mentioned before and it's going to be mentioned after as well. If you have to be alarmed about anything, you really can get a number of 4.0 or higher. The exogenous androgen provided during testosterone production may increase the likelihood of diagnosing prostate cancers that are being masked by low PSA production in men with testosterone deficiencies. PSA levels are being checked at every three months. This is what he actually mentioned. He wondered if there is an issue or if there's a reason to be testing for PSAs uh, or PSA scares, cancer scares, then you want to be testing every three months or every quarterly. Uh, PSA greater than 4.0 rising by this much. Uh, oh, when doubt, refer to biopsy, testosterone positive cancer. And finally, so we come down to testosterone and prostate cancer. There is not now, nor has there ever been a scientific basis for the belief that testosterone causes prostate cancer to grow. Um, conventional me medical wisdom or old school medical wisdom was basically testosterone supplementation is absolutely contraindicated that as we know of so far from all these studies that have been mentioned and referenced that that's exactly the opposite uh, example right there okay this is an important part for him that, that he mentions that I thought was really important so he does give he obviously uh, puts his patients on TRT or testosterone right but every time he does that he mentions that he also gives them a Remedex or an AI and uh and and finasteride as well like five uh something to stop dhc production or the increase in dhc production he doesn't think that testosterone has a direct link or correlation with prostate cancer but estrogen and dhc possibly do so he wants both of these numbers to be controlled now the difference between this person or this medical professional as opposed to the last one that, that i mentioned in my previous video eric serrano <clears throat> serrano did not want you to be looking at numbers he just wanted you to be looking at symptoms so he mentioned as one of his examples that there was someone that had 700 uh, estrogen <clears throat> on a scale of 0 to 50 and that he still did not treat that estrogen because there were no symptoms at that point whereas this person uh, dr michael militech wanted his estrogen to be within numbers of 20 to 30. so i guess different professionals different trains of thought different experiences in the past um, estrogen <clears throat> is important for everyone, both for males and females. It's important for your brain, your bone, your heart, health, everything. Um, he just mentioned this. I'm not sure if this is important or not, but when he does give uh, females hormone replacement therapy, he gives them 80% or 20% E3 and 80% E2. Um, he does not like est estrone and he, because these ones are hydrox hydroxyl groups and these are pro carcinogenic and they can lead to breast cancer formation in women and prostate cancer in men so he, he wants these things to be methylated and he's always testing for these estrogen metabolites 
Estrogen is very important to be measured and you want to try and test for the estrogen metabolites as well as since the hydroxyl groups are pro-carcinogenic. So this is the most uh, complex part, but this was also one of the most interesting parts of the whole thing. Where basically he's, he's trying to imply that if you're supplementing testosterone or giving someone testosterone therapy or androgen therapy, it's not just testosterone. There's like the whole body is interconnected and how is basically how he's trying to explain it. So I'm going to uh, start off here, the final uh, slide pretty much. <clears throat> so in this slide, the brain, there's the brain, the brainstem, hypothalamus, everything else. The, anytime there's anything going on in the brain, it also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, yes, and SPNS. The sympathetic nervous system is going to activate your gut, which is otherwise called the second brain, <clears throat> which is also where 90 plus percent of your serotonin levels are being produced right there. Uh, so anytime, anytime anything is happening in the brain system, it, there's also an effect on the immune system. Now, uh, now the hypothalamus or the HPTA or the HPGA, they work with the pituitary axis, which is that is what the HPA is for. So the brain basically controls how much testosterone you want to produce. Is there enough? Is the like, are you deficient or something of that sort? So the brain and the pituitary are also connected by uh, uh, with each other directly. And cortisol, basically the uh, a hormone that's made by, by the adrenal glands controls and is in correlation with both pituitary as well as adrenal uh, glands. So basically the whole point of it, uh, of this slide was you don't just start off in the brain or you don't just look at the pituitary or any one of these things because every single one of these things is interconnected. Now, what becomes worse is when you add in testosterone, whether it's steroids or whether it's like TRT therapy, whatever version it is, and you add in stress, then both of these things are, are making a huge uh, difference in all different aspects in every single one of these systems. So that's basically what the entire point of this thing was. The effects of testosterone on the CNS. Um, so finally, we get down to his passion, which is the brain and testosterone. So there are no uh, testosterone receptors in the brain. There are progesterone and estrogen receptors, but there's no known testosterone receptors. So if there are no direct testosterone re receptors, but they have found that there's a di direct effect of the testosterone because it enhances your dopamine activity. So how does that help out? No d direct testosterone receptors have been found yet, but the direct effect is enhanced dopamine activity. And he basically shows you like a graph and how it basically works. Uh, now made notes for all of these as well. Now, why this is even important, he mentions that learning and processing has to be emotionally motivated or dopamine driven. So testosterone is working through the brainstem with the blood system to stimulate the ventral tegmental nerve, uh, ventral tegmental area, VTA, this one right here. This is the brainstem, by the way, this is the frontal lobe, uh, VTA right here. And this is exactly where testosterone ends up uh, functioning. So, and supplying through the bloodstream. The blood system is similar to the ventral tegmental area, limbic system, the limbic system or the emotional system of the brain, which is down here, a mesolimbic pathway, as you can see right here. So the limbic system and the emotional system of the brain feel where you get like the feelings of feeling good, pleasure, uh, emotion, and everything of that sort. Testosterone is affecting not just the thinking center, but also the pleasure centers of the brain. So despite not having receptors, it does work through the bloodstream to be functioning and to improve the functioning of these um, mesolimbic pathways and the frontal lobe pathways as well. So that's where the most, that's one of the most important parts of testosterone and its effects and correlation with the brain. Uh, there we go for slide 55. Dopamine increases the amplification signals of the pleasure of the outcome of an action. Dopamine increases the performance. Okay, that's fine. Testosterone has a direct effect on expressing dopamine in the brain. Finally, testosterone acts at the nerve cell membrane as a neurotransmitter without a specific receptor. So this was actually important because um, he, he mentions. Okay, so the reason why this slide or is important or why I'm even mentioning this is because he, he basically went through like an example of people that do not have androgen therapy going on or they don't have testosterone being produced by the testes their brains still show a significant amount of like a measurable amount of testosterone in the brain so this testosterone is not being made by the testes it's not being made by the adrenal glands but it's being made by the nerve cells in the brain itself to be functioning on the nerve cell the cell membrane in the brain so testosterone is being made and has a function in the brain itself so the nerve cells secrete hormones independently of the testicles and the membrane initiated actions this is, these are just some benefits of testosterone. And then finally, uh, one of the things that he mentions is TRT or uh, testosterone replacement therapy and neuropeptides. All of the positive effects of testosterone are enhanced with the use of pharmaceutical grade neuropeptides. And neuropeptide must be individualized for specificity. Uh, unfortunately, he did not mention any specifics of neuropeptides or like general recommendations or something as I, as I mentioned, which I guess 
it kind of points to because he mentions that it has to be individualized for specificity but yeah that was an interesting correlation between testosterone and pharmaceutical grade neuropeptides basically the brain and uh, neuropeptides and, and testosterone okay uh two things that are kind of off topic but that are also really uh, important and, and his views were quite interesting to be honest um so there's a correlation between low testosterone and autism um in so it, it, in the vietnam war the americans were basically uh, uh spraying the Viet, the Viet Cong farms with phthalates or stuff that basically forms plastic to sterilize them because that was their long-term plan to win the war. Um, so at this point, however, both countries and anywhere that basically phthalates are, um, there's, a, there's a huge increase in, in the incidence of autism everywhere. So the details of the study are uh, given in a certain video. The, this, the, so one of the things that he mentions is how phthalates are now absolutely everywhere in the in the oceans, in the whales, in, in your sea urchins, in every single thing that you can possibly think of, uh, phthalates are everywhere. And one of the recent studies where they measured the fecal content uh, of newborns, the fecal content of newborns did contain phthalates in them. So at this point, what he what he's proposing is um, that the, the breakdown of plastic products is basically they're collecting in the microbiome of our guts and are, they're connected to autism uh, a thousand percent according to him and autism is an intrauterine developed condition so plastics from the mother's body are crossing over into the fetal circulation so that was a really interesting uh, topic that i thought of that, that i thought was really worth mentioning over here and then finally somebody asked him about um since this seminar was happening in canada and canada just legalized weed and cannabis <coughs> someone asked him about his opinions on on thc and and what does he think about uh, effects on the brain and testosterone and stuff like that so he, what he basically mentions is thc of the current generation versus the old generation he's comparing both of them um the, the thc of the current generation like they're trying to get the highest possible amount of thc going on which is like exponentially higher than the thc and the cannabinoids that they studied like 20 to 25 years ago and he mentions that we have studies and we know the results of the the cannabinoids of 20 to 25 years ago but not about the extremely exponentially higher amounts of thc right now now where where is this an issue so the brain cells the myelin sheet so the myelin sheet are crucial for the transfer of any and all nerve impulses and the myelin sheet is made up of 95 percent of phospholipids or fats thc or tetrahydrocannabinol uh, by itself is a fat so thc is stored in the myelin sheet around the nerve cells so for anyone that's under the age of 25 where the prefrontal cortex of the brain does not completely develop it's a bad bad idea in his in his opinion uh he does not however have an issue with medical marijuana um these are all of the things that i basically learned from him it was actually a really interesting seminar i'm going like i mentioned before i'm going to mention all of the uh I'm going to copy paste and upload the slides at some point so you guys can go through all of the slides themselves as well as the references. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully you guys got something out of it and I shall see you guys next time.